Welcome to It Is What It Is, a true crime podcast. I am your host, Sean Marie. Today, I'm going to tell you guys about a horribly terrible, sad story. Um, but really, I'm just going to tell you the story about the two people and what happened. And then you guys can make your own conclusions, of course. So, it's... Oh, it's so sad. And once I once I tell you guys how old this kid is and then you guys see the picture, you won't believe it either because I truly didn't believe it. So I'm going to tell you the story of Lawrence King. And he was born on January 13th, 1993 in California. He was 15 years old, 14 years old at the time of his passing. He was born to a 15-year-old mother who was addicted to crack cocaine and alcohol. She was unable to care for him. And so two years later, he and his brother, who was a newborn at the time, were adopted by the King family. His biological father had abandoned them at the time of his childhood. So, unfortunately, he was put into foster care, adopted, and all of that lovely, horrible life. I say lovely because sometimes it is, and then sometimes it's not. I'm not going to say all foster homes and stuff are bad because they're not. But there are some that are not so well. So, at 12 years old, he was placed on probation for theft and vandalism after taking food from a refrigerator in which he was living. In 2007, in November, he was removed from his adoptive home and placed in a group home treatment center, um, Casa Pacifica. Casa Pacifica. Casa Pacifica. Fuck. Casa. After he... His alleged abductive, ab, bleh, after his adoptive, that word is so damn hard for me, father was physically abusing him. Even though his father at the time, Mr. King, did deny this. So he, when he went to Casa Pacifica, he started to feel more open and more comfortable with just who he was at a, as a person and he was I don't I don't know he just came into his very own when he went there and he was attending EO Green Junior High School he was in the 7th grade and he hung out with a bunch of adorable adorable fucking children who did not judge him who loved him and even though his name was Lawrence he went by Larry Larry was very loved and, uh, God, he was a very precious soul, very sweet, very loving, very kind. Um, I can't even, like, I can't even, he's just one of those people that you feel when you know that his life was taken, you feel robbed in a sense that you never got to see what this amazing person would have turned out to be. Larry is truly a loss. And I, I just, I can think of a million things that this poor young man would have gone on to do in the ways of opening other people's eyes around him, especially where we are in 2020 versus when he passed away. It's a very big difference. And I'll tell you why, why nowadays I believe he would have fit in a little better but like I said, he was in seventh grade and his friends were amazing. He was bullied though. Openly bullied because he chose to wear women accessories with his school uniform. He wore high heels and makeup. Which is just... Uh, okay, so in January of 2008, his younger brother was bullied because of his relationship with his big brother which was really just so sad so so fucking sad and some teachers believed his actions were distracting and 
they fought and said that he was violating the school dress code, even though in California, the anti-discrimination law, that they cannot discriminate you based on your gender, your sex, all that loveliness. And it was in the guidelines that like the girls could wear makeup. And so that's what they, it came down to is like, okay, well, if girls can wear makeup, you can't tell him he cannot. It's his choice. But he was told and warned, like, honey, <laughs> you can, but just because you can doesn't mean everybody around you is going to be okay with it. And he was like, okay, babu. And he went about his way. And so it was just absolutely horrible that they, grown ass people, didn't defend either one of these two children okay so he even decided before his murder that he wanted to be called Letitia instead of Larry and the school actually sent out a email before his death about him and it was sent out to every teacher in the EO Green Junior High School on January 29th, 2008, written by the principal. It says, we have a student on campus who has chosen to express his sexuality by wearing makeup. It is his right to do so. Some kids are finding it amusing, others are bothered by it. As long as it does not cause a classroom disruption, he is within his rights. We are asking that you talk to your students about being civil and non-judgmental. They don't have to like it, but they don't have to, but they need to give him his space. We are also asking you to watch for possible problems. If you wish to talk further about it, please see me or the vice principal. And the vice principal is the one who told him, like, honey, you can do what you do, but uh, be careful. Months after this shooting, it was like a bunch, a bunch of kids after he passed had an awakening of sorts because they realized, like, like it's what I said at the beginning of this episode, like that. Larry was gone and like they made fun of him and they they did bully him and they teased him and then they found out obviously all the shit kids don't know like his home life and what was going on with him and how brave and courageous and just absolutely amazing he was in the in the first place to be as flamboyant and open and colorful and bright and like he, the day he got killed oh my god he brought his teacher fucking flowers in a dixie cup like he is just not the person you would picture getting murdered in such a her, her, horrible and hurtful and horrendous and just a shocking way and before he was murdered, he was, the harassment had started to pick up, especially in like the locker room harassment and activities. He would ask to sit at people's table at lunch and they like, they, he just wasn't responded to as well as he should have been. And he would, they say that he would tell people like, he would be like, you know, you want me. Which, believe in this beautiful baby boy. Ugh. And so he would do like the, girl, you know you want me. And he, like his comeback, they said, was, I love you too. Like, thanks. I love you too, baby. Thank you. Like, you have to have such amazing, strong skin to be able to take those daggers and they do penetrate but you don't let anybody see that and instead of crying and being like well fuck you to be like boo i love you too you know you want me quit fucking playing and it's just a way of survival like 
you had you, imagine that imagine that and he's a hispanic boy um his friend says that he's um black and hispanic but just precious absolutely precious and like you can just tell by looking at him that he had that amazing diva attitude like i just picture like this amazing sass confidence loveliness like i don't even know like i just wish i could there's more of this kid and it was just so horrible that he was just taken down and like his dad right this boy is abandoned and he's put into the foster home and he's adopted and like when he gets into the group home he's made fun of and then he stands up for himself and then he gets friends and then he's comfortable and he starts going out of his scared little box that he was in all up before, like all right up before this happens to him and then after his death that's when his father wants to be like oh well now it's my chance to blame everybody under the sun for my son's murder and it just it just hurt my feelings and irked me that like you abandon this sweet beautiful bright sunlight and then after he dies is the only time that you want to stand up and be like the school didn't stop him enough like are you kidding me that school tried to s smother his light like you should have been like the school didn't protect him enough to stand up for who he was not try to smother his light asshole okay so the other boy I'm going to tell you about, and granted, I don't have much on him, but his name is Brandon. Um, McInerney, 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 McInerney. Um, Brandon was born on January 24th, 1994. Oh, wow. They were very close in age, like a year apart almost. That's crazy. In California to his mother who had um, a criminal history and she also had a methamphetamine um, addiction slash in she's from what I understand recovered hopefully that's still the same story in 1993 his mother was shot in the arm by his father William with a 45 caliber pistol it went through the wall through her arm and ended up dropping on the pillow next to her son's head so right off the get dad not a good fella he choked his wife to almost unconsciousness she accused him of selling the ADHD medication which is normally Adderall that was provided for her older son and when that happened, he pled no contest and went to jail for 10 days and then got on probation. And he was on probation for domestic violence as well. Between August of 2000 and February 2001, he had contact with Child Protective Services at least five times to express concerns about his son's living situations with his mother. In 2001, he filed a restraining order against the mom and so and in 2004 he Brandon was placed in the custody with his father who was a very like I said very angry fella very very angry and Brandon did martial arts he um was close to people that in, were in like the KKK Aryan nation type of thing. They believe, I can't remember like what his brother called it, but his brother called it one certain thing. And he said that the guy that they were, that the court was saying was like the white premises, white supremacist guy that he really wasn't. He just believed that, one race should stick to one race and like 
isn't that at least I think the definition of being a white supremacist, like, I don't, I don't know. I'm not really good at the whole, like, white supremacy KKK back history. I'm really not, not my type of jam. So he wanted to go with his mom. I guess he would, Brandon would always cry. He did not want to be at his dad's house. It was horrible. His dad took him on meth deals, on meth runs. This poor sweet little baby boy would hide underneath the table while his dad was doing drug deals. Like, he as well also had a very, very hard time. And he was also taught in the home that being called gay was probably one of the worst things in his house you could have called him. You know, like he, and I'm, dude, I'm not just, I'm not justifying this kid's actions by any fucking means, but we do have to look at where he does come from. Do I believe in the gay panic defense? I do not, but you have to look at, at least when you're judging a situation, yeah, you can go ahead and judge one part of it and stay closed minded to the other side. And that's fine. A lot of people do. But when I have it in front of any anything, not even just this, anything in front of me, I like to know both stories about what happened. So, what happened was, on Valentine's Day, Larry... Everybody was at like lunch or something. And Larry and his friends were all doing like a truth or dare situation. And they were like, I dare you to go up and ask whoever you think is cute to be your Valentine. And Larry looked at Brandon and he says, you know, I like Brandon and I don't blame him. Brandon looks almost exactly like a kid I had a crush on in school. His name was Tim. He had, he looks almost exactly like him. So he thinks that he's cute, right? And that's not a problem. Not a problem at all. Well, King Larry in his high heels, okay, with all that sass, I just imagine swips a hips a swaying, walks into the middle of the basketball court and says, Do you want to be my Valentine? Right? And of course, everybody's Brandon's friends start making fun of him. They're like, oh, you guys will have cute butt babies, blah, blah, blah. And like just giving him a hard fucking time. So after the lunch, everybody is giving Brandon a very hard time. And when King and when Larry and Brandon, I'm sorry, pass in the hallway, they say, some say that Larry calls out, I love you, baby. Mm hmm. And then another teacher says that Larry was seen parading back and forth, like trying to be cutesy in front of Brandon. Mm, I don't know. The, even the, the vice principal said that she did see the other boys like making fun of Brandon and giving him a hard time. And she gave them the good old fashioned wiggled fingered very stern but everybody the teachers and everybody classmates and everybody saw that it truly did bother brandon that this was happening and his sis his girlfriend i almost called it his sister sorry his girlfriend says that like when she would try to break the dress code at this school she would get in trouble but larry could do whatever he wanted and that they really, what it, what the show, at least what I took from it is Brandon's side really tried to do the gay panic defense. And it's that this, him, this incident, okay, the, the volley, the basketball court and everything else and being, wanting to be called by a girl's name is like really what set this off. So... Brandon goes up to one of Larry's friends and he says, say goodbye to your friend because you're never going to see him again. Okay. And that's on February 11th. Now, fast forward to the morning 
of February 12th of 2008. They are in a class together. They're doing um, the Nazis and all that shit. And so they're supposed to go to the computer lab to type up their report. On the surveillance video, there's Larry and his teacher are in the front of the class and everybody else is behind. Well, that day, Brandon doesn't bring his report. So he cannot type on the computer. So where he sits is he sits almost like directly behind where Larry is sitting. Okay. In the lab, in the laboratory, in the computer lab. So he's standing, he's sitting, sorry, sitting behind Larry and looking at Larry's back of Larry's dome. And like I said, that morning he had given his teacher some flowers in a Dixie cup. You can even see, like, it's just this poor lady. And she had, I have to mention this before I tell you what happened. This teacher had given him a dress before he passed away that was one of her daughter's dresses. A cute little green strapless dress. And some people try to make it seem like Larry was out prancing around in this dress and I do just want to make it clear that he was not at all so now at exactly 8 15 in the morning Brandon takes a 22 that he had forgotten at home and had to go back inside to get he takes it from his bag and he shoots Larry in the back of the head once the teacher turns around and she says, what the hell are you doing? Because she thinks in her mind that he just blew up a computer and he's the only person standing in the class. So she's like, Brandon, what the hell? And he shot him again in the back of the head. He tosses the handgun on the floor and he leaves. The cops catch up with him about seven minutes later, walking down the street. Larry is then taken to the hospital where he is put on life support for two days, mainly just for his organs to be donated for time for that, for them to find the people and all that. Like in front of like, I think they said like 24 children in class. These children witness this. The school decides that they're going to take all these kids that just witnessed this horrible thing, put them into a room, and have them watch Jaws. <laughs> that is the movie that was chosen for these children to watch. Jaws. Out of your goddamn mind. So... Literally, after his death, and the media is sparked, because this is after Matthew Shepard and his mom, Judy, actually went on one of the news outlets and talked about how she was shocked that so many years after her son's brutal death, if anybody hasn't listened to that, I've done an episode on him, um... So Matthew Shepard's mom is like, this is absolutely horrible. Absolutely horrible. Ellen Generous comes out and she says some stuff. Hillary Clinton. There's a, there was a parade, a gay pride parade that went past the school that had never, ever gone past the school before. And that was only four days after the shooting that like all these people went out in droves and showed their support for this man, it, this young man. It was insane. And I don't even like it was just crazy. So many people afterward came out. A visual was held for him a year after his death, uh, a day of silence in 2008 happened a protest happened for the LGBT in April this happened in February like I just 
I don't know. And like then they then they do say that his adopted father that was his problem with Larry, they say. And this is what Wikipedia said. Okay. His adopted son. Okay. Larry's adopted father, Mr. King, says <clears throat> that his son was harassing Brandon and that he is concerned that Larry was being made into a, po a poster child for gay rights. Are you kidding me? No, he was, I don't, I'm torn. I don't think he was harassing him at all. I believe that the these two boys should have been brought into a room and it should have been like okay larry you may think that brandon's cute you need to keep that to yourself because you're making brandon feel uncomfortable and yes brandon get did get made fun of and it is up to the school to tell those boys like it is not okay just because of this and that to make fun of him i get all that but we need to remember that these are 14 and 15 year old boys Okay, and it's a school that is, in the school's eyes, there's even one teacher that was like, if Larry was my kid that year, he wouldn't have died. In the school's eyes, Larry's a problem. Not everybody views him that way. I would have fucking adored him. But, like, in the school's eyes, they're like, okay, well, we... They say they didn't do what they needed to do to protect Brandon. And then they mention Larry. So it's really fucked up on both sides. You know, like it's really, I don't know, it's really horrible. And they say that they failed Brandon because of the bullying and that they could have pushed harder to stop Larry from being so open and amazing. And in August, Larry's family filed a claim against the school for allowing him to wear the makeup and the flamboyant clothing. And they said that the school doing that is the main leading factor in the cause of their son's death. What? It was just insane. And according to the California Attorney General's office, they're like, bro, the school couldn't have stopped him anyway because of the rights. Y'all wanted rights. Y'all got them. Stop it. And in a article published on July 19th in 2008 some teachers from there said that the vice principal the assistant principal whichever encouraged Larry's flamboyancy and to help them further the quote unquote agenda uh-huh and King's father, adopted father, describes this to be a slap in the face. Like, are you guys kidding me? And then they said that the, that the school needed someone to be more of a qualified person. Like, ugh. And in February of 2008, Brandon's lawyers went in front of the judge and asking for a change of venue because they don't feel that he can get the right people. I'm assuming it's mainly the right people. And so on July 24th, they did, uh, the judge decided that he would be tried as an adult because his lawyers, the main thing with his lawyers is they are out to say that it's not okay for you to try a child as an adult because they are a child and that they can grow to change. They can grow to understand the wrong error of their ways and change and to become better people. 
is what his lawyers believe. And they took his case pro bono. And his one lawyer, like, went and got a tattoo that says Free Brandon. She's really fucking creepy. Really creepy. <clears throat> Anywho, so that happened in July. And in August, he went in and he pled not guilty for the hate crime because they were trying to give him a hate crime too. And everybody was saying this is not a hate crime, that he literally just felt that this was the only way to make Larry stop having a crush on him and stop humiliating him in front of his friends was to do this. What? Right? Like, I'm not the only one that thinks that's fucking stupid. So... Everything was rescheduled. His preliminary hearing, it was set for September. It was rescheduled for October. And in on September 23rd, a coin, the court appointed one of his lawyers guardian of him. What? I don't understand that part. And like Wikipedia is the only part I've ever heard mentioned that the documentary doesn't say anything about that. But I don't know that that could be and could not be true. That is just what Wikipedia said. So I did want to mention that because a bunch of people attack me because they go and read the Wikipedias and they're like, well, you didn't say this and Wikipedia said this. So I just want to put that out there. It is on there, but I don't know if that's really true. It was absolutely horrible so the courts they do try to make a gag order for like all of the testimony and everything else and the judge throws that out they're like not going to happen and so on december they ruled that he needs to be evaluated and he needs to do all that like the psychologically and the psychologist all that and that he was competent to stand trial and he, dude, I tell you, I tell you what, they tried their damnedest to postpone this shit. So it starts in 08, right? And it goes all the way up until I think like 2011. But his dad, Brandon's dad kills himself. On March 18th. And the judge lets Brandon go to the funeral and everything too. He's really... I wouldn't say he's getting tr special treatment at all. But I mean... And a bunch of people were mad about that. They were like, oh, well, why did he get to go to his dad's funeral? But really, it's his dad's funeral. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yes, some people don't get to go to funerals, but some people do. And the guards, literally, when guards testified about this, about Brandon, they cried. They looked at him as a son. Like, they felt so much compassion for him as well. And they say that the death really did bother Brandon. Like, this, I guess he had to take medication for sleeping. But anyway. Um... It goes on, and like I said, it goes on and goes on, and they go back to court a million fucking times before they actually start trial, which is just absolutely crazy to me. And the jurors that they asked for were supposed to be ones that didn't have a problem locking away a child for life. So... The first trial begins and starts, and on the first day, his half-brother is seen talking to the jurors and saying, quote, the fate of my brother is in your hands. And so he was banned from the courtroom. He wasn't allowed to testify. I mean, sorry, that's the only way he was allowed in the courtroom is if he was allowed to testify. Which is just crazy. He was very passionate about trying to keep his brother out of prison for the rest of his life. And the prosecutor described Brandon as a popular teen 
who was skilled in martial arts and firing guns and for being known as a white supremacist. She went on to describe Larry as a small guy who was picked on, who wore high heel boots, makeup, and jewelry, along with his school uniform. Now, Brandon's attorney described Larry as an aggressor, as pretty much saying that his sexual, his him being so sexually aggressive and making inappropriate marks is what provoked Brandon to do this in the first place. Both witness, witnesses on all sides testified on July 7th that it was a, it was a Larry liked him, Brandon hated him situation and that it really did bother him that he changed his, was wanting everybody to call him Letitia instead of Larry. And they were always making fun of Larry and calling him very harsh names behind his back because he did come to school wearing makeup and jewelry. And that it was just, I don't know, the school was not fair to him. A few witnesses did say that they did see the behavior between the two boys. But they did say that when they heard the sexual comments, that, that it was just, quote unquote, messing around with Brandon. Uh, and the formal principal testified in July also that she had discussed with a bunch of the other teachers about how distracting it was, but how their hands were tied because of the new laws just passed in California at the time. So it was kind of one of those things. They were like, well, what do we do? What can we not do? And other people had said, other teachers had come forward and said that other students had said that Larry had made remarks to them that were inappropriate and that some of the behavior should be considered sexual harassment, but there's nothing that they could really do because it was wasn't brought to them at the time of the situation from what I understand it was after the fact and it was like oh okay well this happened and so yeah Larry said this to me too type of shit it wasn't like at the time Larry says it they go tell an adult and get it taken care of type of situation and so on July 12 22nd okay of 2011 the jury was shown footage of Brandon getting in a fight in the juvenile hall. When the correction officers testified that he was a quote, good kid in the honors program for good behavior. He had really good relationships with other people within the jail system. <sighs> they do say he was not prone to violence. Now I just want to make this clear. Okay, because I get why the state is like, well, look, he's vicious and he's crazy. But when you go to Brandon's side and you're like, well, why did he attack that other inmate child? Then you find out that he was Brandon's getting picked on and harassed by three other dudes. And when you're in jail, it's the respect game. Okay, us people on the streets, we don't agree with it. We don't, we don't understand it. We don't, we look at it and we go, that doesn't make any fucking sense. Them in there, it makes sense. If someone's trying to punk you out and make you less of a man than you feel you are, if you do not do something, then that shows everybody else that you can be fucked with. You can be poked at, you can be prodded at. So you do, you have to stand on your ground. You have to stand up right then and there and be like, nah, fuck you. I'm going to smash you right here, right now. And that's what happened from what they've said is that that is what you find out that he was, they say a good kid all up until he, this problems with three other children started 
and it turned into a I'm big, I'm bad thing within the jail with him and other inmates. And so, unfortunately, it happened during his trial. And so it got to be used against him. And I do say unfortunately, because as many of you guys know who do listen to my podcast, my brother has been in jail since fucking conception. And so I know my brother is a very sweet child at some, I still call him a child at some point in times he is, but he has done things inside of that building that are, I'm not too fond of, but I understand what, why he has done some of the dumbass shit he has done. Jail is a different being inside of a, um, facility like that is a whole other world. And I've never been there myself, like actually in there. I've just gone to visit a million hundred times and I know a bunch of people who have gone through it. And so I understand that him showing more aggression is bad, but I also see where he's trying to survive. And Brandon did not get in trouble with any the law or anything else all up until this point. And neither was Larry. Larry was not in trouble at all except for the stealing of fucking food, which I'm, I think we can all gather that this means not Larry literally had no criminal record. You stole food, honey. So you have two boys. One snaps, viciously murders the other one. And they don't even come to a conclusion, dude. No, like they, the jurors are so like they, they agree. Yes. He did murder someone. Yes. That does need to be handled, but they don't believe he needs to go away forever. So it's just shows that like, and they do, they wrote some, one of the ladies wrote to the judge and was like, I can't believe you're going to, cause they obviously are going to try him again. They're not going to just let him get away with the first trial. They're going to try him again. And like some of the jurors like wrote letters to the judge and were like, how dare you like this poor child. And they said that it was quote, his only way out. Like, and they said that King had been bullying, Larry had been bullying Brandon and it was Brandon's only way out to kill him. And that Brandon did go to another young man and say, Hey, let's beat the shit out of Larry. And that young man was like, "Mm, I'm not really cool with Larry being gay, but I'm also not going to beat him up for it. And so they say, well, what is he supposed to do when he's a man by himself? He doesn't want to beat this kid up because that's not okay. And no one would support him or back him. So he fucking murders him. Like there's, that's what I, like you, you need to look at. Now, if that was the case, if this was a case of beating up situation and Larry passes away, you have grounds. You know what I mean? But no, you sat there and looked at this little, he is so little. God, he is so fucking little. You looked at the back of this little boy's head for a good 20 fucking minutes or so before you did what you did. So I'm sorry. I don't see how you had time. You forgot got the gun that morning and had to go back. You almost didn't do it. And then you find out that he wants to be called by a girl's name. And then you say, well, that just pushed me over the, I had to, I had to. No, you thought that out the day before you tell his friend, I'm killing him tomorrow. You ain't seeing him after tomorrow. You take it. Like you sit there, you ponder, you do it. Those are things that you have to be accountable for. This is not an after school incident where it was like, oh, he was walking down the street and Larry said, ooh, baby, ooh, baby. Brandon went in his house, got the gun and killed him. That's not the situation. This was a classroom full of children. 
and you took a big boy weapon and went into a classroom and executed your fellow student amongst your stu- amongst your classmates. Yeah, you might have a hard life, but that does not justify that type of murder. Not only are you ending a life, you are traumatizing the fuck out of a good 24 other people. And that's trauma that you just got to go to jail. You just got to go away. These people have to deal with being scared when they hear firecrackers. There was a child sitting next to him. Then it leads up to all the being scared because he was killed because he was gay. Wow. And now you have all these other students who are telling their parents, they're like, oh my God, I'm gay. Like, I don't want to die because of me being me. It's so horrible. I remember when my friend Nash showed me um, Boys Don't Cry for the first time. And one of the students in this documentary talk about it as well. And it's... That movie, if you have not seen that movie, will crush your heart and tear your heart into a million little pieces. It is the saddest fucking movie. And it's just like you can truly, horrible people are out there that will kill you just for being you. And it's absolutely horrible. His second trial did start in September of 2011. And... I don't know. Like that's when it was supposed to start and on 20 and on November 21st, 2011, he took a plea deal for a second degree murder, voluntary um voluntary manslaughter in the use of a firearm. He was sentenced to 21 years behind bars and once he turned 18 that he would be sentenced to the adult prison with no credit given to the time served and he could not get off on good behavior either so he is currently in prison um right now in california for right now until he's released and so if you do the math on that that's that's putting him about 36 years old when he gets out Maybe. I'm not really good at math. Somewhere in his 30s, which is fucked up. And like, the documentary is on HBO. And it's a very, very good one. And I just... There's a part where his brother, Brandon's brother, is talking about all of the things... That Brandon's not going to be able to do. That he was scared, I should say. That Brandon wasn't going to be able to do. That he was going to not be able to lose his virginity, drive a car, have kids. And that his life was gone. And he kept saying his life is gone. His life is gone. What about the sweet man, boy... Not even a man. Oh my God, he was a baby. Absolutely, he was just a baby. What about him? He will never get to be the amazing person. I guarantee you he would have been. I guarantee you we would have not seen, we would have seen amazing big things from Letitia King. And so it's just... How dare you snuff out this beautiful light all because he said he liked you. And like, yeah, maybe he didn't need to go as far as making it as big of big as known, but he did. And one of his friends told him, he asked, Larry asked one of his friends, one of his gay friends one time, how can you be so open? And he told him, he said, Larry, honey, no one's going to kill you because you're gay. Everybody's different. It's the joys of being different. 
and a year later he was killed for being gay. How horrible. How absolutely horrible. And the school did nothing to really help those children that were in that classroom that day. They gave them one day of counseling. One day, suck it the fuck up and move on. And to go back to the, go back to the computer lab. Go back. The teacher was like, well, can we have laptops so that the kids don't have to go back right away? And the school was like, well, no, they can suck it up. The group home made a beautiful little garden path for his friends and memorialized it. There's a tree planted at the school, but they can't put on the plaque that it was for him because why talk about it? Why bring it up again? How they failed these two boys incredibly. They failed them both. They failed them both. No one should be picked on. No one should feel like someone liking them is the end of the world. No one should have that feeling. You should be able to say, hey, you liking me makes me uncomfortable. I'm not that. I'm not your way, bud. Like, I don't row the same boat you row. Go ahead and row. I'm just going to row over here and do my own thing. And sadly, Brandon wasn't taught that. He wasn't taught that. He wasn't taught to say, hey, thanks. I'm a handsome kid. I'm a good looking kid. Thank you. But I'm good, bro. And to tell his friends, like, shut up. You know, at least he thinks I'm hot. It means y'all fuckers are ugly. And it, the fact that people out there and not even just Brandon, but people out there can kill someone because they choose to be gay. I swear, most of the greatest men I've met that I know that are gay, I love them 10 times more because they are. Like, they're amazing. Absolutely amazing. And my little sister had a gay friend growing up. His name was Adam. And to this very day, I like to love it when I see him. He did my maternity pictures with my first child. He likes to walk around on the 4th of July in high heels and booty shorts and a fucking tank top all the way up to his titties. And he's beautiful and he's amazing and he's glorious and he stomps with pride and confidence. And then you got my friend, my dearest friends who just got married. You got my Chantel and Brittany. Congratulations. My two lesbians. They just went and got married. Holy unions and what not have yous. Being gay is probably one of the coolest, bravest things I think a person can come out and say that they are. Next to my friend growing up, Nash, who came out and legit, legitly, I believe, firmly in this, was born into the wrong body. He was always meant to be a boy. Unfortunately, God just didn't agree with him. But he is now. He always has been. I've never looked at him any differently than a boy. And I saw the struggles that he had our whole childhood. I wouldn't say our whole childhood because we were in our teenagers. We were teenagers. But like I saw the shit he went through, dude. Not being right and not feeling right in the body that he was in. And I could only imagine inside, I wasn't the nicest person to live with. I really wasn't. I was a horrible bully to him. I bullied him and I picked on him. A lot. Because of the fact that he was different. And I can openly and honestly admit that I only did that because I was having my own problems. And it was easier to pick on him to give me a, bo a bigger boost in life. And to make me feel bigger than him. It wasn't his fault. He had a fucking crap up bringing too. It was never his fault. I was just hurting in my own way and took it out on him. So like I can admit that I have not always been the greatest and the nicest to people of differences than me but to take someone's life because they are different from you makes you probably one of the biggest monsters in the world and on that note Letitia King Larry King I'm so sorry we lost you 
this world missed out on something very amazing and someone who probably would have done amazing things for his environment and his group. And so it's just a loss and it's very sad. And I hope that Brandon, when he gets out, because he is going to be given that chance, that he truly does not fuck it up. And I understand that while you're in prison, rehabilitation, at least in some prisons, is not number one priority. So we can only hope that he gets some sort of rehabilitation and does something good with the second chance that he is given when he wrongfully and I don't even know it, ma it makes me very angry and I don't believe I don't I don't believe kids should be locked up forever I don't I do believe a life for a life but then again you do have to look at they are children but then you also have to think about if we lock you up when you are a child we are putting you into a dog pound. We are putting you into an environment that you are mentally not able to handle and that you are easily, your mind is like putty. And we are putting children into grown situations and expecting them to spend 21 years in a grown man situation going into it as a young man with no one telling him the right moves to make or what the world's evolving to or how you need to act or how maybe the next time some man that says you're cute and hot does not get murdered by your hand. We don't teach you these things. So hopefully after 21 years of being thrown into a live or die scenario every day, I'm not saying prison is absolutely horrible every day, but I'm pretty sure it comes pretty fucking close to it. And so, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully you do what's right, man. I hope. Because you took a bright light. So, that's it for today. Follow me on Twitter at it is what it is 208 On Instagram, it is what it is pod19, all together, no spaces on Facebook and YouTube at It Is What It Is, a true crime podcast. Thank you. Have a great week and keep it classy. Bye.